presenter is recordings in progress uh, each presenter will be present will be talking for about 20 minutes um uh, i'll be quite strict with the timing but we, you know we have got a, a little bit of leeway with it um but we want to kind of make sure we've got plenty of times for questions and answers at the end probably for timings if we can keep the questions for the end of the session so after both of the presentations so what you can do is either jot them down yourself or if you wanted to pop them in the chat window then please do so. If your question is for a particular person, then just say who that question is directed to, okay? It might be the case you want to ask both, both of the speakers, but that's absolutely fine. Just again, for those of you who just recently joined, if you can just make sure that all, all your cameras are turned off and your, your, your microphones are muted, that'd be brilliant. Okay, so I'm going to introduce some of the first of our two speakers. So our first speaker is Daniel Hibbs Woodings. Um, Daniel is an experienced housing professional who has worked for seven years in the area of social housing. Um, and he works now as a community and customer relationship manager for Tonic Housing, which is a nonprofit organization. Oh, okay. Paul's being radical and saying it's fine to leave your cameras on. I, I, I kind of agree. It's, it's nice to kind of see that there is someone out there. <laughs> so if, if just keep your microphones muted, but do do uh, do feel free to keep your cam cameras on. Absolutely. So Daniel's talk is going to be uh, the housing needs of older LGBTQ plus people, uh, the work of tonic housing. So I'm going to hand you over now to Daniel. Like I said, the questions, if you can keep them till the end of both presenters, that would be brilliant. OK, so I'm going to hand you now over to Daniel. Brilliant. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for all being here. Hello um, to all you wonderful Bristolians and people from further afield. Um, as I just said, my name is Danny. I am the Community and Customer Engagement Manager for Tonic Housing. Um, so this is us here. Hopefully you can all see my screen, fingers crossed. Um, cool. So um, who is Tonic Housing? What is Tonic Housing? Who are we? Um, so Tonic Housing Association is a community benefit society. Um, we are registered with charitable aims and we were established in 2014. Um, really to look at the issues that we know exist um, pertaining to loneliness and isolation. Um, that we know um, particularly affect um, LGBT people as they age. Um, as an organisation, we're a very, very small, tight-knit team of four people. Um, we've got myself, um, I do all of the community and Recording in progress. Um, progress. Um, oops. I'm getting feedback. There we go. That's back. But all right. So we got myself, as I mentioned, we've got uh, Matthew, um, my colleague who does all of our fancy Swish um, marketing and communications. Uh, we have Bella, who is our wonderful admin support assistant, and we're led um, by our CEO, Anna Keir. Um, we're also stewarded and led by um, a strong majority of LGBTQ plus people, um, and also by our community panel. Now, community panel are all representative service users who might want to live in somewhere like Tonic, and they really steer and guide everything that we do as an organization. So I'll take you over here. So why are we here? So um, you, you may not be LGBT yourself, but um, I think we, we all know that LGBT people have faced absolutely decades of discrimination. And sadly, many of us still do to this day. Um, as I mentioned, we were um, created in 2014, predominantly to look at loneliness and isolation through a housing lens. Um, in that we need to look to provide specific housing and support, as until very recently, there was none in the UK. Um, we've commissioned some research um, to, to really hammer home that point. It's called the Building Safe Choices Report. Um, and that was the largest study that was ever done um, with older LGBTQ people in London, um, specifically with a housing focus. What we found from that research was that um, people just want to see housing, care and support services that are safe for them to live in, that celebrate them and recognise their identities. Um, they want policymakers and change makers to uh, recognise that sometimes we have different wants and different needs and they need to be accommodated within service provision. And also they wanted to see more advice and, su and support around housing, how they access housing and associated services. It's a really interesting report. I promise you it's not, um, I promise you it's, it's not dry or dull. It's really interesting. So please do pop onto our website or drop me an email if you want to get a copy of that. 
Um, so what do we do about it? Well, we're an organization that takes action and not uh, we don't just kind of talk about things for, for years and years. So we were really proud that this year um, we were able to launch the UK's first LGBT affirming retirement community. Now, just for avoidance of doubt, and I, I always find it helps to um, talk about what that means. Um, LGBT affirming, what is that? Well, it means it's a space where you don't necessarily need to be LGBT, but if you are, you can be safe in the knowledge that services are designed around you, they were designed for you, and they were designed by the people, um, by the people of our community. So as I mentioned, we've got a community panel, we've got a, a heavily represented uh, LGBT staff base, and we're led by the community in everything we do through conversation and not consultation. So, Bankhouse itself um, is, you can see a little map there, it's right by the Thames. Um, it comprises 59 um, apartments for affordable rent and 25 apartments for shared ownership. Um, we've taken ownership of 19 of those properties um, and we're gonna be selling those properties, but the whole building is now Tonica Bankhouse, which means anything that, um, whether you're a Tonic resident or whether you live in the other properties in the building, you benefit from what we offer. In terms of our properties, we've got a mixture of one and two beds, so loads have got uh, most of them have got, have got balconies and fabulous views of either the Thames or the whole of South London. You can see all the way from Blackheath to Crystal Palace. Um, and it's important to note here that Tonic isn't a care home. It's not a nursing home. It's um, what's described as an independent living um, environment, also known as extra care. Um, and we use the term retirement community. That means all of our residents have their complete privacy in a self-enclosed private flat, um, where they've got a kitchen, a bathroom, and everything is 100% accessible. Um, but we've created, we've, we've created community spaces so our community can come together, form, have a cup of tea, a coffee, a cocktail, and, and enjoy that community. Um, as part of the building, there's a, there's a garden, uh, there's a roof terrace, there's a bookable guest suite. Um, there is a police car going outside my house. Yep, yeah, it stopped, apologies. <laughs> there is a bookable guest suite. There's, um, there's all the amenities like bike storage and guest parking. And then we've got those aforementioned community areas. We've got a, a restaurant, a fully licensed bar, a little snug area that we're turning into a library at the moment, and all your other amenities like laundrette and stuff on site and free, free of charge. So this is Bank House itself. You can see on the left, it's a Norman Foster design building. So it looks a little bit like a spaceship. Um, Norman Foster's the same guy who did, uh, the same architectural firm that did the Gherkin um, and a lot of stuff on Olympic Park. Um, and then you can see one of the views from the Thames over there. Um, you can see one of our flats here. So this is one of our wonderful two bed flats. This is the Soho. We named them all after our favorite LGBT areas of London. Um, so you can see they're really lovely, spacious, beautiful apartments. Um, and then this is one of our one bed apartments. So you can see again, this is, um, they're, they're just, they're really lovely environment. They're brand new um, and they've, yeah, they've never been lived in before. So we do have five residents in the process of moving in, um, but we are looking for, for new applicants and new people who want to help us to build this community. And finally, yeah, you can see our beautiful roof garden. You can see the shard um, and you get a little sneaky uh, peak of St. Paul's as well. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see part of our community areas, which has got um, a beautiful uh, tropical fish tank in there. I am trying to get rainbow fish in there at some point, um, but um, yeah, watch this space. Um, so as I mentioned, what, what is it that makes this environment different? Well, for us, it's, you know, and I'm going to talk about the care in, in a moment, um, but for us, community comes first. Um, care is a given, community comes first. We are completely community-led and we're soon to be resident-led. Now, what that means is our residents decide what we do. They decide what their home looks like. Um, we're doing a really fantastic project at the moment where we're replacing all of the artwork in the community areas. Now, we've been working with a load of artists, some based in Brighton, some based in London, and we're gonna be, um, we're gonna be putting all of this artwork to our residents and getting them to select it all with us and be really involved in that process right from the start. Um, so everything we do is, is resident-led and some really good examples of things that residents have come up with and that we've responded to are things that we have now delivering. So we've got a film club going. Um, our first film was Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, which was the most, um, it was incredibly rude and uh, rather raunchy and really good fun. Um, we've got popcorn machines and all kinds of things. Um, we're running Tea with Tonic as well, which is a really nice opportunity for residents just to come and sit and have a cup of tea and talk to Tonic staff and meet their neighbors um, in, in a really warm and relaxed environment. 
Some of our first residents are very keen gardeners as well. Um, so they're going to be um, working as part of our gardening club to transform all of our gardens. Um, we've already got plans for um, a, a big massive herb garden um, and, and a lovely kind of rose installation thing that I'm not sure on, but the residents are, are sure on it. So I think it's going to look fantastic. And we're also doing things like in, in, in the um, realm of arts and crafts, painting. Um, and again, as I mentioned, this all comes from residents. Um, one of our residents said they were really interested in shared reading. Um, and so in January, we've, we're already going to be installing the Tonic Library. Um, and we're going to be creating an LGBT affirming book club where people can read um, queer literature if they want, or even just their favourite books, even if they're not LGBT. And that's really what our space is. It's just somewhere where you can be yourself, you can relax with the knowledge that you are in a, in a safe, supported and affirming environment. So community always comes first, but we recognise people do have those concerns as they're beginning to grow older about, well, what will my care look like um, as I grow? Um, so Bank House has 24 hour um, on -site, an on-site care team available. We have a fully set up care and support model um, available to all residents. It isn't a requirement that you have care when you move in, but it is something that you can take on as, when, and if you need it. Um, and as I said, it's, a, it's that optional service. So we've stripped it out of our eligibility requirements. Um, and care provision is really tailored to our residents' needs. So if you were to move in with us, we'd sit down and have the conversation about what you want to see from your care. Um, I didn't mention before, but we have a bookable spa room with an accessible bath. So that's something that you can kind of, you can put the Sonos speakers on and you can relax to your, um, in, in a private environment. Um, and we're also setting up um, relationships with um, LGBT external service providers all over London. So we've got an LGBT hairdressers, um, a gay friendly nail technician. We've got um, a massage therapist that we're hoping to introduce soon. So all really nice things, again, all at the suggestion of the community. So just a tiny bit of interest, um, a bit, bit of information about how these properties are offered. So it's called older person shared ownership. Um, some of you may know about um, regular shared ownership. This is a slightly um, different version. This is where people buy between 25 and 75% of the property. And um, that final 25% that you can't buy um, stays with Tonic. And we keep that as what's called a community asset. Now that means um, that we always have an equitable stake in our properties, which means we can continue to offer these properties into the future. So it's a community asset, not now, uh, not just for now uh, or just for one generation, but forever. Um, and the benefit to our residents is there's no rent charge on that part. Um, I put some information on the eligibility requirements there. Um, it is an over 55 scheme. Sorry, there's another uh, siren going past. Um, it is an over 55 scheme um, and there are a couple of other eligibility requirements, but um, I'm, I'm, I'd be more than happy to have a conversation if you, if you might be interested. Um, and um, there is affordable rented housing available in the building uh, via One Housing Group. So there are eligibility requirements for that as well, but I'd be more than happy to have a discussion about, um, about access to those properties as well. So um, I don't know how long I've been on, I'm not too sure, but um, I've, um, this has been really fab and I know there's normally loads and loads of questions. Um, we do have so much more information on our website. We've got one specifically about Tonic at Bank House. Um, so that's tonic at bankhouse.org. Um, you can find out more about Tonic generally. Um, there's a probably not very flattering photo of me on there and all of the staff team um, on tonichousing.org.uk. You're always welcome to email me um, and, and have a conversation with me about, uh, about anything. If you're, if you're interested in Tonic, if you're interested in partnering with us as an organization, um, if you're interested in living with us, we are led and guided by the LGBT community in everything we do. So thank you all so much for, for having me. Um, and I look forward to hearing some questions at the end. Cheers, thank you. Okay, that's, that's brilliant. Thanks, thanks for that. And um, uh, yeah, if, if, if um, I'm sure there'll be loads of questions at the end, as you say. So if, if people can hold off and, and, and just make a note of them or we'll pop them in the chat window, that'd be brilliant. But that was a, a wonderful presentation. The, the apartments look amazing. I mean, what an incredible design anyway. So, <laughs> but and the co-production ethos is, is kind of exceptional. So yeah, I'm sure there will be loads of questions later. So uh, we're not allowing you to go anywhere for the next <laughs> 20 minutes. Don't worry, you've got me for as long as you need. <laughs> okay, so we're going to hand over now to Paul Willis. Um, so Paul is 
an associate professor in social work and social gerontology in the School for Social Policy Studies at the University of Bristol. Um, he's also head of the Centre for Research in Health and Social Care in the school and a uh, senior fellow of the NIHR School for Social Care Research. Now, the title of Paul's talk is Inclusive Neighbourhoods for Older People, Promoting Social Inclusion in Housing with Care for Older People. And he's going to be talking about findings from the DICE study. So I shall hand you now over to Paul. Thanks, Gary. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. And you can see my slides. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. It's wonderful to be presenting alongside Daniel and the fantastic work that Tonic are doing. Um, so I'm going to talk about some findings that we've discovered from a recent study looking at social inclusion practices in housing with care and support for older people. The study is based at the University of Bristol. Um, this is the research team, uh, myself and my other colleagues in the School for Policy Studies and my colleague Brian Beach from the Institute of Epidemiology and Health at UCL and Jeremy Porteous from Housing Lynn. Um, it was a project in collaboration um, with ILC, the International Longevity Centre UK, and with three housing providers across England and Wales. And we've been very grateful for their support. We don't name the housing providers when we're presenting the findings, um, just because some providers are bigger than others and we want to make sure that we um, respect the confidentiality of residents who have taken part in the study. So the project's called the DICE project, which stands for Diversity in Care Environments. So it's background context. Um, we know well in this group that um, we are living with an ageing population, and that means that the number of older people um, living in housing with care and support schemes or needing that kind of um, care and support attached to independent living is going to grow, and that's expected to continue to rise. So there's an increasing demand there. So this was a three-year research project and um, was funded by the Economic and Social Research Council where we want to explore and examine what does social inclusion look like, um, particularly for older people from socially diverse backgrounds within housing schemes. So when we talk about social minority background, we're referring to older people, um, and mostly uh, 60 years of age, of age and over, um, who identify with social characteristics that are sometimes uh, subject to discrimination or marginalisation. So for us, that included residents with physical and learning disabilities and cognitive disabilities, people identifying as lesbian, gay and bisexual and trans, people identifying with black and minority ethnic groups and with minority faith groups. And some of these areas are protected characteristics under the Equality Act as well. All of these are actually groups are. So what do we mean by social inclusion? When we talk about social inclusion, we were interested in these four areas, these four domains. So we're interested in the individual identities and the beliefs um, and the characteristics and attributes of the residents themselves within the housing schemes. And part of that, connected to that, we're interested in the social environment within each scheme and the dynamics, the social dynamics between residents, but equally importantly, between residents and staff. We're also interested in the built environment, and that came out as a, a key finding in our study, the significance of the built environment for making people feel included and connected. And that can also include the neighbourhood location and the general locality. And another key factor is the wider structural and policy factors. Um, so what are some of the policy drivers and priorities that lead to this form of housing or that may actually be um, barriers to providing more of this, for, this type of housing? When we're talking about housing with care and support, um, we're talking to similar schemes to what Daniel was talking about. So uh, independent living, um, extra care, um, and some schemes that are formerly known as sheltered housing. Um, but they're all schemes that provide some degree of care and support services um, through different care providers on site for residents where they need that. So how do we do the research? Um, a number of different ways in which we gathered the perspectives of residents and staff. We had a self-completed questionnaire by residents across Wales and England, um, and we gathered some responses from 95 different schemes. We had interviews with staff, 
across eight schemes, um, with residents across eight, eight schemes, so um, up to 72 residents took part in the study and spoke to us about their experiences. And we spoke to stakeholders, so these are people who are involved in commissioning, policy work, um, advocacy for older people to gather their views. And some of the interviews of residents um, were longitudinal, so that means over a period of time. So we could learn more about people's experiences over time. And as it happened, this also included the experiences of um, lockdown uh, over 2020. So we were able to um, gather some quite unique experiences about the challenges that people experienced over that really extraordinary time. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we learnt from the survey of residents. So this was a survey to collect a range of information from residents um, across uh, 95 schemes. We distributed um, uh, between 3,000 to 4,000 surveys to um, three providers across 104 schemes, and we had 741 residents take back. Uh, take part rather. So that meant they um, filled in the questionnaire, a hard copy that came through their letterbox and they popped it in a, in a um, postage paid envelope and sent it back to us. So we were really delighted with that response and that's about a 23.6% a response rate, which, which was, isn't too bad. So we used some questions or what's sometimes called domains from the English Longitudinal Study of Ageing in particular um, wave eight of that uh, longitudinal study. And this is so we could make some comparisons about what uh, life was like, social life was like for residents within the schemes compared to older people, people of the same age um, or same ages living in the general community. So we included some questions from that survey about background, about health, about people, how people report their health, about psychosocial well-being, about people's social networks, housing and discrimination. So this is what our sample looked like. Um, our uh, 741 participants, the majority were between 65 to 89. We had a small number over 90 years of age. Um, just over majority were women. Um, and again, majority lived alone. Um, majority were heterosexual. Um, and majority were of a white ethnic group. Um, and we attempted to address this through some of our interview methods. We were able to focus more on uh, minority groups that we weren't able to capture quite successfully in the survey. And unsurprisingly, 77% of our sample were living with a chronic illness or disability. And I say unsurprising because often these kind of schemes are well suited to support people with disabilities to be able to continue living independently with a bit of extra support. So in terms of perceptions of housing schemes, you can see here um, some different coloured columns. Um, this just shows um, what some of the responses were from residents about questions about social activities. So the majority agree that their housing setting offers many positive opportunities to socialise with other residents. Um, but when we get to whether my housing setting organises social activities that are appropriate to my needs, um, the agreement slightly drops and we see a more um, stratified response, so the more mixed responses to that particular question. And similarly, when we get to, I find it challenging to participate in social activities, we see more people selecting neutral, so more uncertainty um, about that question and a slightly more um, uh, disagreeing, which is, which is one positive aspect. And when we get to whether I find it uncomfortable to attend social activities in my setting, um, again, we see um, some more mixed responses, but just over or near half um, disagreeing with that statement. So we can take from this that the um, residents are appointed, so there are positive opportunities to socialise with other residents, but some perhaps more mixed views about how appropriate those are and how easy it is to take part in those kinds of activities. We asked if people had ever experienced uh, discrimination, and this is just in general, and you can see there the responses um, from our survey participants. Um, so the majority reported um, feeling less courteous, uh, sorry, the greatest number reported less, courteous, less courtesy or respect from other people. Um, and then the second most popular response was people thinking you're not clever. But the people also um, recognise discrimination from uh, through poor service from doctors and hospitals, feeling threatened and harassed, um, and experiencing poor service at restaurants and stores. 
And when we asked people about whether you've seen discrimination within your scheme where you currently live, we did have some small numbers reporting discrimination that they'd witnessed. Um, so a very small amount from staff, 4.8%, but perhaps a little bit more worryingly, we see 12.6%. Um, so over, um, over a tenth of our sample reporting witnessing discrimination from other residents. And this chimed with what we learned from some of our interviews too. So a common way of uh, figuring out whether people are experiencing loneliness and what degree of loneliness people are experiencing is this um, a scale called a three item UCLA score ranging from three, which often means not lonely to nine, which refers to higher experiences of loneliness. So we compared the average loneliness scores from our respondents from our survey with respondents from the Eng English Longitudinal Study of Aging, and that's the, the Wave 9 survey. And there was a particular matching technique we applied um, to enable us to do that. And we found that um, after we applied our matching and weighting that DICE respondents, the respondents in our survey, the residents in our survey, appeared to have a significantly lower average score for loneliness than if they were living in the general community. So this is a really positive finding for us. So just some implications from the survey data. Um, in terms of perceptions of housing, there's agreement from our survey participants that schemes offer positive social opportunities. Um, so lots of opportunities to socialize with others, but there's some scope to improve that, to make it less challenging to take part. Um, up to a third of our sample experiencing some exclusionary pressure in relation to discrimination. And that's, oh, that's taking into account their general experiences, not just within the scheme they live, um, but discrimination from staff a third the level of that from other residents. And housing with care residents in our survey appear to have lower average scores for loneliness. Now, this is a really important message. So one interpretation we can make from this message is that housing schemes are working well in preventing loneliness amongst older adults living within them. But I wanted to talk to you about some of the factors about what, make it, what makes a housing environment inclusive. And this is what we learned from our interview data. I'm just keeping an eye on my stopwatch so I don't waffle on too long. Um, this is what our uh, 72 interview participants look like. Um, these again, residents um, uh, with the average age being 72. Participants raged. We had a small number of participants who were under 60 years of age, um, which reflects um, the demographics of a lot of the schemes that took part in the study. Most were between 61 to 70 and 71 to 80. Um, the majority were female, and, and that's unsurprising because that often matches the demographics within the schemes. We had a small number um, from black and minority ethnic groups, um, or who identified as white other, so for example, from a different European background, and a small number with minority faith. And we had a slightly higher numbers of residents who identified as lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans. Um, just so the majority lived alone, the majority um, were renting their properties, um, and over half had a disability or a chronic illness. So when we look at social isolation in a bit more depth, we found that residents with minority identities did often feel more isolated in the schemes that they were based. So these are residents who identified as LGBT, um, with black and minority ethnic groups, um, and also people with disabilities. And often people with these minority identities were looking outward for their social connections. So what we mean by that is that they often looked to uh, friendships, social groups, um, so communities outside the scheme as part of their main social network, rather than looking for friendships within the scheme. So a lot of residents spoke to us about making active choices in not wanting to take part in scheme life and social activities. And we've included a couple of quotes there from, um, from these pis participants just to um, illustrate uh, some of these, these issues. But we also found some examples of what we've called boundary setting within schemes. And this is where residents who identified with majority characteristics, so identified, um, for example, as heterosexual um, and as white British would sometimes through their conversation and through their, through their speech and their expressions um, would sometimes create barriers between themselves and residents who belong to minority groups. It may not be intentional from the speaker, but nonetheless, it sometimes increases sense of isolation for residents from minority groups. 
So boundary setting um, was quite prominent um, on the basis of disability. Um, and we saw some residents talking about um, residents with learning difficulties or with some cognitive impairments or cognitive disabilities such as dementia as not belonging within this scheme. So you can see at the top quote on the right, this is from a resident who spoke to us that too many people with high support needs here, which cannot be accommodated in independent living schemes. And we had a quote from another resident here who's talking about some of the difficulties they've experienced in getting accessible communication um, from staff and management to help them be able to access that. So there was an extensive of exclusion from some residents um, for people with dementia and for people um, with learning difficulties. But we also spoke to residents with physical disabilities and we found there were some barriers um, in terms of staff resident communication and also sometimes the physical design. So for example, some communal areas on site not being wheelchair accessible. And as I mentioned before, this exclusionary views expressed towards residents um, experiencing some cognitive de decline associated with dementia. What were some of the factors that facilitated social inclusion and, and that increased social connections? Um, we learned some really great factors from both staff and residents that make a difference. So having a shared identity with other residents, being newbies together as you both or multiple people enter the scheme together at around about the same time. Supportive neighbours came up often, um, neighbours who are welcoming, that um, gave invitations to events, that assisted others with day-to-day -day tasks. Having external connections, so having social networks that are strong and that you're a regular participant in outside of the scheme. Um, so often a lot of the residents we spoke to had social connections already embedded in the local community. Having an active role and participation in scheme life was really important. So residents talked to us about their involvement in resident committees and associations, in gardening and green care and connection to the green environment, um, the role in welcoming new residents and making people feel welcome to the scheme. And we saw lots of really great examples of the ways um, in which staff within scheme sought to really support and encourage residents to take part in the scheme and have an active role. So both staff and residents made a difference in making other residents feel included and connected. And another prominent theme from our conversations were, um, was the presence of on-site staff. This came up time and time again from residents about the importance of having staff on-site that you build a relationship with, that you have a connection with, and that can respond quickly because they know you well. Um, so that knowing residents, encouraging engagement, participation where some residents may be um, more socially withdrawn or may be experiencing conflict with other residents and sort of seeking involvement. And another important factor was the close connection with carers. So for some of those residents who had regular carers come in and provide support on a day-to-day -day basis, um, the carers were really fundamental because they knew the residents well that they were supporting. So they're able to pick up when some residents were socially withdrawn and be able to check in um, with new residents as well. There's a quote here about um, uh, a person moving into the scheme and finding how friendly everybody was. Other factors was the importance of physical design of the scheme, the ways in which the scheme was architecturally designed. So balconies and garden patios, those external spaces that are connected to everyone's apartment were really important for facilitating social interaction, particularly so during the COVID restrictions. Um, this was really important because people were able to come out into their balconies and patios, have conversations at a safe social distance, um, able to participate in group activities like doorstep exercise, um, and just able to connect with each other at a time when people were feeling particularly isolated. So, and communal spaces were also really important. So cafes, restaurants, uh, activity rooms, really important spaces to bring people together. Sometimes there are informal communal areas um, where some schemes, um, particularly older schemes that hadn't been purpose built around this particular type of living, um, didn't always have communal spaces. So residents created informal spaces for communication, uh, for 
for interaction. So we heard about um, laundries and car parks being popular areas. And this is really positive in the sense that residents being proactive in terms of uh, meeting up with each other and creating new spaces to socialize. But the downside is obviously that these aren't ideal spaces for facilitating regular contact, particularly as the weather becomes more, um, becomes colder and uh, the conditions become uh, less conducive to, to spending time outside. But communal areas and rooms could also be sites of conflict and exclusion. So sometimes there were resident subgroups or cliques that we heard about, um, which made other residents feel uncomfortable or unwelcome. And the digital infrastructure was really important. And we heard a lot from residents about the importance of having Wi-Fi access um, to be able to do things like texting and emailing family members um, and video calls even more important during lockdowns. Some barriers to social inclusion and feeling connected. Um, really the opposite to what I've already been talking about in many ways. Um, so schemes that had a lack of social activities and didn't, didn't have communal spaces as part of the physical design of the scheme. Some social activities being seen as more appealing to women um, and for women belong, and for um, people identifying as a lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender. Sometimes some of those activities seen as more appealing to heterosexual women. Lack of staff on site, um, and that was often named as a barrier for residents requiring additional support. And we think this is an important implication because we know a lot of housing providers are moving towards floating support where there aren't people based on site all the time. Um, and we think that this is really worth thinking about because it's clearly a valued factor by residents. And sometimes an attention encouraging resident involvement, um, particularly for staff, that tension between wanting to support residents to be involved and giving a bit of encouragement, but also having to respect people's independence and recognising this is people's own home, this is a neighbourhood, um, and in to respect people's choices about how much they want to be involved and included in scheme life. And as I mentioned before, sometimes the formation of dominant resident groups that created no-go zones for other residents. So, for example, we heard from one resident about um, a particular difficult point in, uh, in her scheme recently where they had to um, use a different exit to leave the scheme because they felt intimidated by other residents. So let's finish on some recommendations because I reckon my time is just about up. It is <laughs> for housing providers and staff. These are some of the messages that we think are important. Um, investment in staff on site because we know from our findings that um, these people are fundamental for building and maintaining an inclusive environment. And we heard about the importance of um, reception staff, about estate staff, um, as well as carers. Um, so it was a whole range of staff in different roles. We think we need to, there needs to be continuous training about social inclusion and about how disadvantage can accumulate for older people, people particular people from uh, minority groups. Um, so some future learning about that and how that, that can have implications for people's choices about housing. The importance of early and proactive engagement with residents, particularly those belonging to minority groups, and making sure that those people's lives and identities are reflected in uh, scheme life and in the organisation of activities. The importance of consulting residents about the design of schemes, and we're talking about the social design, so the social activities um, and the ways in which the scheme life runs. And um, Daniel's already given the fantastic example of co-production and consultation there. And the investment in communal areas um, and the social value of diverse activities on site that are both inward and outward facing. So we heard lots of really lovely examples of schemes bringing in out, um, uh, external organisations. So for example, one scheme um, ho would host a dementia um, cafe, dementia friendly cafe on a regular weekday. And the residents within the scheme would help run the cafe with the organisation coming in. Um, and that was open to general members of the public who wanted to access that service. And it goes without saying that all um, housing schemes having a good digital infrastructure. So what next? I will stop shortly, Gary, I promise. Um, we're, gonna, we're in the process of creating an online learning resource for staff and we've recorded a series of podcasts um, capturing the diverse stories of different residents. Um, from different minority groups and we'll create um, accompanying learning, learning points to go with that. We're going to write a practice briefing, briefing for managers and staff which we'll, we will circulate through the Housing Lean um, website. 
We've got a launch event online on the 27th of January with ILC UK. You're all very welcome to come to that um, and keep in touch with us and we'll send an invitation. And we're going to have a residence launch in Bristol just to thank and recognise um, the residents that have been involved, including um, residents on our reference group. That's our website. Um, I'll put it in the chat or maybe one of my DICE colleagues on the call might pop it in the chat. Um, and that's my email and you can follow us on Twitter. If you send us an email, we'll make sure that you get an invite to the launch. Thanks very much. That's great. Thanks, Paul. Um, so another excellent talk. So I'm sure that, again, there's going to be some questions uh, popping in the, the chat window of that. Um, just to kind of say, I, I will go through the questions in a moment, but I think I've managed to backtrack with the, 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 the questions from some of my colleagues, but I, I the, the signal dropped out. Uh, <laughs> so I lost everything in the chat window. So if, if I do miss any questions from the, the first part, then just, just let me know, okay? But, um, so I've got a couple of questions at the moment directed at Daniel. So, um, Got a question from Kay Libby, um, AGK Bristol. Um, the question is, is Bank House open to the local community, for example, uh, for events or to use the communal areas? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's, um, so we, it's worth mentioning first, we, um, part of our research was actually heading over to the States um, to explore the SAGE um, LGBT retirement communities over there. The America is uh, leaps and bounds ahead of us with this. They've got about 17 of these already set up. Um, and one of the real benefits to um, their, to, to their centers is that the, um, the community spaces are on the ground floor which makes it really easy to open up um, those spaces to the public. Um, now for Bank House, it's um, slightly more, um, it's a little bit more difficult, but we wanna make it happen, definitely. Um, our community spaces are actually on the first floor, so it's not as accessible from the street. Now, we, we do prefer that to some extent because we the, the safety of our residents is, is absolutely kind of our, our primary concern that we have to think about. So um, getting yourself up to the first floor is quite easy, but you do have to be let in. Um, now, when it comes to the external community, absolutely, you know, we, one thing that we found from our research and conversations that we have with people is that our community doesn't want to be kind of siloed away. Um, they want the community to, to bleed out and to exist with the local community. So while I've been, um, so for the, before Bank House was launched, I spent um, about nine months um, reaching out to um, LGBT networks, organizations, um, charities, sometimes just three or four people that met in the pub once a week, um, predominantly within um, Lambeth, to really see how we can start working in partnership with local organizations. So one really nice example of that is we are um, hopefully running a project soon with an organization called In Common. Um, In Common um, work with younger children and we're gonna see if we can perform some intergenerational activities with children from local schools. Um, we're also in conversation with a, um, a community garden down the road um, to see if we can um, do some kind of co-gardening thing between the community garden there and the, um, the, the garden and outside spaces that are, that are within Bank House. So absolutely, you know, we, I, I think the key thing is we want to be led by residents um, and it's always a little bit um, tricky before you have residents because you have to give them your best first shot and then you have to let residents to kind of craft and design those things, which amazingly they're already doing even in, in advance of their move-in so it's exciting because we've actually got our first resident moving in tomorrow so um that whole, whole thing then kicks off at that point so absolutely we're very very keen to do um yeah to, to make sure people are connected and that they're they're not isolated from from their local community that's great Thank, thanks very much um okay i've got a question from someone called paul willis um uh, it's a question to himself. No, it's not. It's the question to Daniel. How long did it take to get this property off the ground? Uh, li literally or figuratively? <laughs> any, any challenges or barriers encountered along the way? Uh, it took ages and there was loads, is the short answer. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, we, we originally envisioned building um, a ground-up scheme ourselves. Um, after a while, it became really clear that for an organisation with no track record um, and without sadly about 50 million quid for our own kind of development costs it was going to be incredibly difficult to do that 
Now, one interesting thing is as part of that process, um, we worked with the community to develop kind of a, a nice to haves and a must haves list. So what did our community want to see? One example was on the must have, have list was, um, was shared community spaces. Um, so, so that was something um, Paul was just talking about there. Um, access to shared community spaces. So once we then um, began to look at the opportunities of partnership working with, um, with housing or with uh, housing associations uh, in pre-existing schemes, we then used that list that we would have built to take to um, new schemes to see, well, how many of these boxes do we, do we actually tick um, with this scheme? And amazingly, when we, went, when we went to Bank House, it ticked every single must have and I think all but one nice have. I think I think somebody wanted a swimming pool, which we couldn't accommodate in the end, unfortunately. Um, but it really, really did tick all the boxes, and it was the building that we would have built. Um, the The issue then was, of course, you know, going back to us being an organisation with no track record. It was first of all proving our point, which was why we worked with Stonewall Housing and uh, Open Indoors London to commission the Building Safe Choices report. Um, until then, there was very little data on older LGBTQ people and the need of why a scheme like this was necessary. And then obviously the elephant in the room was the funding um, and the finance of that. Where do you get this amount of money from? Um, from? And it's worth mentioning that we were always very keen um, on, our first ship, on our first scheme, um, Tonic having a level of ownership within our properties. We wanted to be owners within our properties because we wanted to create a, a permanent asset. Um, we didn't want to set up um, just a kind of service agreement um, because we didn't feel like that had um, enough permanence to, to what we wanted to create when we wanted to create something in, in perpetuity. So we were really proud to be able to work with One Housing um, who have the properties available for us and they were so accommodating and we are now working in a really strong partnership together. And our funding is actually provided on a loan agreement from the Mayor of London's office um, as part of Sadiq Khan's community housing initiative. Um, so we were really proud and really happy. We um, it was the it was the largest um, dispensement of funds um, ever for the community housing fund, um, and I think that one of one of the key things really is the political support that we've had. We've had really strong support from Sadiq Khan. We've had really strong support from Deputy Mayor Tom Copley, um, as well as obviously One Housing, as I mentioned. So the stars aligned and it it, it worked for us. Um, but we're always keen to um, make sure that the the memory of other organisations who've kind of paved the way for us is recognised. So one example is Polari Housing Association in the nineties, um, who um, they they attempted something similar, but with a wide range of factors, one of them being um, a strong lack of political support, um, weren't able to do that. But we always think it's really important to say, you know, we might be the first that did it, but people have been talking about this idea for 50, 60 years um, from the conversations we have. And so it's uh, this is this is the community that pulled together and, and helped us to get to this point. Great. I mean, yeah, it's incredible that you've got the, the political backing. Like you say, it's kind of absolutely essential, but no, amazing. Um, okay. Oh, I've uh, got a question from Ian, Ian Quaif, uh, Bristol Older People's Forum. Yeah. Um, is this, Ian, is this question for Daniel, is it for Paul? Well, I can both answer it. I don't mind. No, it's for Paul, really, I think. Is um, it? Okay. Yeah I, yeah, I think there's power. There's a lot of power in words. And, I, mm. you know, I'm not com completely at ease with the idea of, you know, being offered, being put into a scheme. You know, but mm. I'm an old fella, right? I don't want to be put into a scheme, Ian. Not really. And I'm just mm. wondering if we should think about some of the words that we use when, de you know, when kind of addressing. I, I, it's not. I'm not. It's not a criticism because we we've all used it, but mm. Mm. I'm just throwing it out there. I'm not it's a really good question, Ian, and you raise a really good point about the power of language and the kind of connotations it has. And um, I'm. I'm the way you're describing scheme there isn't the way that um, residents living within those, um, I'll say communities, um, how they perceived it either. They saw that as um, um, a place they wanted to be, a desirable place to live. I think that's that's really important. Um, and, and people wanted to move in there um, because of the perceived benefits. So yeah, we've been thinking about this language too, because we're nearing the end of the study and want to get the words right when we report. So we're thinking about talking about inclusive communities or inclusive neighbourhoods, because in many ways, the schemes are like micro neighbourhoods, small, yeah. very small scale neighbourhoods. And that kind of reflects the independent dimension to living there as well, that people are not, you know, these aren't institutions, these aren't um, environments where 
people are kind of restricted in any way from doing the things that are important to them and connecting to the people important to them. So yeah, yeah, we're on the same wavelength. Um, so yeah, I recognize I've used that word through the presentation and you've made me think about what, um, how, how I kind of uh, pitch the present future presentations. Well, we'll just on, yeah, just quickly. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I use, I've been using sheltered housing, you know, as, as well as extra mm -hmm. care. And it just got me thinking, well, sheltered houses, can you could put that in the same sort of category. I think you you use the term independent living, which I think is a better mm. way of describing mm. it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, Daniel, if you've got a view on this. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we always use the term retirement community. We're actually prospective members of ARCO, the um, retirement community operated trade body. And um, so what is it? The setting, they kind of set the standards for retirement communities. Mm. Um, Interestingly, they, they just had their conference a while back and have introduced a new term, um, which is hopefully an all encompassing one, which is integrated retirement communities, um, which is um, so it's worth I'll pop a, I'll pop a link in the chat for it. Um, I mean, we, we 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 in all of our communications, marketing and, and generally when I'm speaking to people, I try and use the term retirement community. I think um, it's not that every but just to say, though, Daniel, no, not everybody's retired you know people are working i'm i'm an old fella i'm still working we, you know you continue working so not everyone so i think there's some kind of just debates over around that one as well Definitely. retirement communities because yeah. we're not but retired because we, we've got some residents moving in who are still working they're still freelancing yeah. um, and so it is it's it's a tricky term I, I don't have the complete answer i think we I, in, in day to day life, I'll, um, I will often use um, the term extra care, but I'll, I'll yeah, often yeah. use that when um, we're talking, when, when I might be interacting with somebody yeah, yeah. who has a care need, for example. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's often very situational, but you raise a really good point about retirement communities because we actually, we actually stripped, um, it used to be, um, it used to be a requirement that anybody li lived in properties like ours had to be not in work. Oh, right, yeah. You were very much of the view of like, well, wait a minute, our properties are for 55 year olds and up. Like <laughs> people are working way after that. Um, so we, we actually stripped that requirement out. So it's um, for us, it's absolutely a term. But yeah, it's, it's worth some thought for sure. Just finally, can I just on a positive note, a more pos even more positive note, I kind of like the, your little slogan about conversation, not consultation. I think that's a really good way to look at it because we want older people to be around the table involved in those decisions and not kind of a consultation tick box exercise so i like i like that slogan thank, thank you. you yeah Co consultation it fills me with dread because <laughs> it reminds me of um I, I always feel like what a consultation is is a board goes and makes a decision and they'll present three options for consultation yeah. Yeah. And my view is like no, no no we all need to bring together the three options and then we can have a if you want to hold a consultation then we can but first comes mm. a different thing thanks thank you cheers thank you cheers again Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ian. I mean, that, I mean, the, the, the issue of language is just um, an absolute, um, oh, such a hot topic. And, and you know, it's, it's good that you brought that up there. And, and it, you know, when we're looking at any aspect of language, especially in terms of when we're talking about older adults, for example, then, yeah, and we could carry on all afternoon, all day, probably talking about language because it is such a, a, an important topic. So, yeah, brilliant point. Thank you. Um, got a couple of more questions here from from Kay. K from AGK Bristol. This one, one for Daniel, one for Paul. Um, question for Daniel then is, do you anticipate that the care and support available will be flexible and able to accommodate people's needs for a long time? I'm wondering if people can stay instead, can stay instead of going to a care home, for instance. That's a really good question. Um, I think the first thing um, we have to address is um, what our limitations are within independent care. We're, we're not a nursing home and there isn't nursing home care um, in, in our in, in bank house. And um, we make that really clear to customers um, to, to residents, sorry, um, at the, right at the start of the process. Um, so we, we have to outline our limitations um, because right now, although um, I think there certainly is, um, I mean, from, from the conversations I'm having and from what we hear from the community, I think there is certainly a want for, um, for potentially stepped up care to be LGBT affirming and people want to see provision like that. But we're just not in the, in the position um, to be able to pr provide that right now. Hopefully we are in the future. Um, so what we do with, um, if, if somebody 
requires care or even if they've got a concern about care but don't actually have a care need um, when they're moving in with us is we sit down and talk about um, what provision looks like and what those limitations look like. In terms of Bank House's track record, the scheme has actually been open since 2017 and they're re they really, really prioritize, prioritize um, independence and personal choice in terms of what people want to do. I think to date of all residents, they've um, one person has been moved um, into a more stepped up um, nursing care facility um, and that was done on that person's own choice. Um, so they really, really want to be as flexible as possible with um, with ensuring people can stay in their homes. So they work a lot with um, the local healthcare services, district nurses, for example, um, to, to, to create as much integrative care with any medical treatment they're receiving. But we just, you know, for, for now, until we are able to hopefully offer something um, that looks like more steps up service in the future, um, we just have to be really transparent. Um, I mean, one, one fabulous example of, of uh, an organization just doing that is called, um, they're based in Berlin, they're called Lebensort Vielfalt, and I'll throw a, a link in the chat for you. Um, and they've got an amazing thing as well, um, where they effectively have, um, they start people off in kind of like a co-housing environment, so there's no care at all, but it's just where older LGBT people can live together. Then they have this um, separate kind of um, independent living wing where people still have their own, um, their own flats and their own facilities. Um, but there is that kind of care and support and then they finally have a few beds for 24 hour care and support for if people's care needs get so high and that's um yeah fabulous it's a germany's a different world certainly in terms of funding um but yeah i'll, I'll throw in a, a link now to our international page so you can see all the amazing international examples that have inspired us to, to what we do hopefully that answers the question Kay, somewhat that'd be great it'd be interesting to look at that link Thanks, thanks, Daniel. Um, I, I know Kay, you got another question, but I, I can see that Daryl Collins, you got your hand up. Do, did you want to? Who did you want to pose a question to? Um, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I suspect it's more Paul. Okay. Than Daniel, um, I'm I'm in South Gloucester at Over Fifties Forum, um, and we we often have discussions around um, the type of housing that that you're describing. But the, I'm fascinated at the, the facts and figures through especially Paul's presentation, I think, because they're more local to me more than anything else. Um, and whether there was any, any thoughts around es extrapolating, is that, is that a word? Some of that information into community living, i.e. Um, my street or my locality more than um, a, a, an older people's village or whatever that it, it's called around here. Um, one, they're very expensive, but let's not go down that, that road just now. H how can it, some of that information be developed mm. to um, throw an, an arm, if you write? I live in Filton, so how about Filton? And that area of Filton, how we can throw an arm around our community of film mm, mm. And, and start developing some of these things that these housing or villages bring in terms of of community care mm. so if, if that and I'm sorry if that drags us away from housing as such but it's, it's okay your presentation has, has raised that question in my mind mm. thank you very much um, it's a really interesting question, Daryl. Um, so most of our survey data, those facts and figures that you talked about, is um, unique to the experiences of living within the housing um, housing communities that we've been talking about. But the, the figures about discrimination, um, that, I mean, we possibly could extrapolate that. Um, my kind of quant colleagues might shudder as I say that but you could get us because that question was about experiences of discrimination more broadly um, so for example most of our respondents or not most of our respondents sorry the um, a large um, the largest uh, category the most popular category in terms of discrimination reported by our respondents um, was around feeling like people don't treat you with courtesy and respect or feeling like um, you receive poorer services um, from shops and services. So I think those, just looking at those two points alone as concerns and as um, areas of discrimination, we don't know what the discrimination looks like, um, but 
um, in this group, we could probably take a pretty good guess that ageism is part of that. Um, so perhaps there's there's some something we can take about out of that in terms of um, making uh, communities, general communities, neighbourhoods more age friendly. And I know that Age UK Bristol um, has been leading a lot of work around making Bristol age an age friendly city. Um, and I think there's possibly some really good work to look at there in terms of how we build on the strengths within the communities that you're living in. Um, so, for example, neighbourhoods within Filton community. I don't know whether um, um, Kay or any of the Age UK colleagues wanted to briefly talk about that or respond any further. Oh, it's being handballed to Bianca. <laughs> she, she knows yes. more than I do on this. Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely fine. <laughs> Absolutely fine. I have to apologise. I think I popped off to grab a glass of water when Daryl asked his question. Um, is there any chance you could repeat your question again, Daryl? And I'll come back on, on anything that, that we've been doing with Age Friendly Bristol related to that. Uh, trust me, switch it off instead of on. <laughs> um, brief, briefly, it was about how some of the research that Paul through the universities, etc., done towards um, villages or whatever buildings to mm -hmm. hold people. How how that research could be uh, used to develop communities on the ground, like the street I live on or the the area that I live in. How how some of those findings that his research has has found can be used locally rather than in a an old people's village or wherever. Yeah, sure. So in terms of sort of, yeah, just, just in main, what we call mainstream housing, did you say you're in Filton? Is that right? Yeah. Um, something you might find interesting actually, Dal, is we produced a, um, a toolkit, a sort of booklet, um, a couple of years ago, which is called Make Your Neighbourhood Age Friendly. And that's basically practical tips um, mm. for people who want to make a change in their local area. So it's both kind of things you can do voluntarily, but also um, how you can sort of get funding to, to improve your areas. That might be improving sort of shared areas if you've got sort of like a, a back alley that, you know, you want to put some planters in and, and make it a nicer environment and, and what you can do to make your neighbourhood more socially inclusive and start up activities as well. And it, it, there's also guidance on sort of being able to, like knowing what routes through, through the city council there are to, to get changes made as well. Um, and it just sort of outlines what, what we've learned about what, what makes a difference, what improves kind of social inclusion and connection at a, a neighbourhood level. So outside of things like specialist retirement housing. So that might be something something interesting. I'll, if you can access the, the chat, I'll put a link um, in the chat to that and we can also Feel free, I'll put my email address as well. Feel, feel free to email me. I'll have a think about anything else that, that might be interesting for you to look at because we have quite a lot of um, research, but it's it's accessible um, sort of evaluation reports um, about um, some community development that we did as well, um, including in North Bristol. Um, so I can send that over to you and I, I can send you a copy in the post as well of that toolkit that I mentioned. Thank you very much. The, yeah. the email's fine, there's no need to go to postage. But thank Great. you very much. All right, I'll, I'll put that in the chat now. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, great question. Thank you. Um, I got another question then for Paul uh, from uh, Kay. Uh, do you have Do you have an idea of how much dedicated housing there is for people with minority identities, and where this is more common, such as in cities? Mm -hmm. Um. I do in relation to LGBT friendly schemes. I don't in relation to, I mean, I'm aware there are ex examples of um, uh, types of housing communities that are tailored for people belonging to particular faith groups um, and minority ethnic groups. So I know there are some Jewish organizations that run um, extra care, um, support and living for people connected to the Jewish, commu Jewish communities. And I know um, in relation to LGBT, as far as I'm aware, there's only the two schemes so far that have got off the ground of obviously Daniel's fantastic project and 
the work that LGBT Foundation are planning for Manchester. And I think that's, I see Daniel nodding, so I'm obviously saying something correct. Um, that's the extra planned and also an extra care scheme, I think, being planned. Is that right, Daniel? Yeah, yeah. So that's the LGBT Foundation and Hanover. So they've mm -hmm. they've announced their their partnership with one another. I think they're yet to get planning permission. So that's um that's upcoming. Um there are another couple of schemes. There's one in none of which have broken ground yet, but there's a Pride of Place in Leeds. Um and they um I, I think they, they are looking certainly for some provision for older and um, LGBT people. Um there is another one in Birmingham, but I've forgotten its name. Um but yeah, they are, they're all, um, I mean, they're, they're all um, community-led organisations generally. What I'll do is I'll post a link to um, the community-led housing website, and that's got a map of all of the amazing schemes um, that not just LGBT schemes, but um, just loads of local communities coming together to solve their own housing need. It's really inspiring. So I'll send a link for that now. And I think the name of the organisation I was thinking before is Jewish Care. I look at their website too. Yeah, I think you'd raise the issue there about location, um, Kay, and I think we have to be mindful that s s this kind of specialist provision is urban based. Um, so that's um, great within those com within those areas, but it needs needs some further planning and thinking and, and, and resourcing about how we kind of create um, perhaps on a smaller scale this kind of provision. Um, that's accessible to people in um, rural areas. Brilliant. Okay. Um, I see Daniel's just put, put the link in there. Um, any, any, uh, any, anyone else got any uh, other questions? Anyone want to pop their microphones on their videos and pose a question? Robin's got his hand up. Has he? Robin. Hi. hi. Uh, I've turned out to be someone better at drafting a chat question than ever finding out how to send it so <laughs> fairly typical of me I'm afraid um, it's really a question I think primarily for Paul in that as one of my roles I'm chair of care and repair England that fights for the importance of home uh, repair and home adaptation for elderly owner occupiers particularly those on low incomes and I guess one of the concerns I, I have a bit is about almost the imbalance of research on extra care housing relative to the vast majority of older people that are in mainstream housing, including people from the groups that you've specifically been looking at in the DICE research. And mm. I'm just interested in your reflections on that and whether the sort of extra care housing research community have any kind of obligations about emphasizing the importance of keeping all housing options for older people rather than by accident almost play into a narrative about the fact that older people need to downsize from their family homes as it were that's a, a really interesting point and there was a, a really good report you've probably seen it from the center for aging better that came out a couple of months ago about poor housing um and uh prevalence of poor housing, particularly amongst older people living in the community. I mean, we set, we set out to look at this social inclusion agenda in this these kind of schemes, just mainly because we were aware that there's been a lot of focus on social exclusion um, for older people, both within the broader community and, and perhaps to a lesser extent to in within um, housing, uh, unique housing communities and support. So we were more interested in the what's the flip side of that that looks um, looks like. And of course, to unpack that, you need to think, well, what does social exclusion look like? And, and inevitably, people talk about experiences of social exclusion um, as a way of exploring that. I see we I see um, the 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 valuable point you're making here, Robin, that we don't want to entirely put all our eggs in one basket and invest and detract from the fact that people already have well-established independence and well-established identities within general communities that they that they've lived in for a long time. Um, yeah. I don't really have anything concrete to say, but may, I don't know whether, I mean, I've got my other um, colleagues on the call here. I know Elsa's here um, from our team and Randall's here also from our department who have been doing a lot of research in this area for quite a while as well, as well as yourself, of course. I don't know if anyone else has got some reflections about, about this, about this idea about responsibility.
Um, or the extra care providers on the call too, so they might have some thoughts about this as well. But Elsa, I, I, well, I think it's a, a question that Robin's asked me before in other settings, and I, I still don't have an answer. I mean, there is this wider interest in different sorts of models, and the wider recognition of the importance of sorting out oh, providing support to people living in their own homes, whether they're renting or owning. Um, but I don't have an answer to your question. Sorry, Robin, still failing you. Is it that the, you think there's a, might there be a danger that um, while more resourcing goes in this form of housing, that there isn't equal amounts of resourcing or if not um, equitable amount of resourcing going into supporting people to continue living comfortably in a good quality of life in their own home? I, th I think that's a real risk. I think some of the information around the poor quality of housing say in the north of England is quite shocking mm. so I think mm. for people on lower incomes who are older I mean that's a real concern but equally I have a concern which was in a sense my other concern about extra care housing which I've also asked Elsa in the past is the one that Kay asked which effectively is how good is extra care it's sticking with people when the going gets really tough mm. as opposed to if you retain perhaps a slightly greater degree of independence if you stay within mainstream housing. So, you know, these are these are tough things. But, and I guess for me, the biggest worry that whenever you get a government working group around all of this, it is dominated by the extra care housing developers. And there are virtually no voices in those forums arguing for the importance of maintaining our basic mainstream housing infrastructure to good accessibility standards and mm. within the foreseeable future that's where the majority of older people are going to be yeah yeah that's a really good point brilliant uh, uh has anyone else got any questions that i might be missing anyone else got their hand up doesn't look like it. Um, okay, I mean, shall we shall we uh, draw it to a conclusion there? Um, that was a nice, thought-provoking question to uh, keep everyone's uh, brains ticking over for the rest of the afternoon. Um, so, on behalf of everyone here, then I'd like to uh, sort of thank the two excellent speakers. Um, it, it is obviously a really important and thriving area, and as you can, you know, the, the discussion I'm sure could carry on and, and on. Uh, and also thank everyone for posing such excellent questions to our speakers, um, keeping them on their toes. To keep your eye out really for the, the next webinar, which will be in the new year. And um, it's too early to talk about Christmas and things like that. But, you know, just we won't see you. I won't see you before then. But so do have a have a good time. But enjoy and take care and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. And thank you for coming along to this, this session today. OK, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good day.